Have you ever wondered why the mystery of the Somerton Man lingered in silence for an astonishing 70 years? With well, a myriad of theories, but no acknowledgement. What secrets could have kept this enigma veiled for so long? Join us on Crime Scene Archives as we embark on a journey to unravel the perplexing story of the Somerton Man, exploring the countless theories and hidden reasons behind his enduring disappearance. Warning, this video contains graphic content related to crime scenes. It is intended for educational purposes only. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. Over the course of several decades, various authorities, academics, and the general public have engaged in speculative discussions regarding the enigmatic identity of the Somerton Man. Discovered lifeless on a beach near Adelaide, Australia on December 1, 1948, this mysterious figure has been subject to a plethora of theories, ranging from allegations of espionage as a Russian spy to being a victim of poisoning, orchestrated by a scorned lover. Other conjectures include associations with smuggling activities or even a past life as a ballet dancer. Nevertheless, recent findings, as elucidated by Hillary Whitman in a CNN report, introduce a seemingly less sensational perspective. A novel DNA analysis points towards the Somerton man being identified as Carl Charles Webb, an electrical engineer hailing from Melbourne, whose existence mysteriously faded from public records in April 1947. Derek Abbott, a physicist and electronic engineer affiliated with the University of Adelaide, collaborated with Colleen Fitzpatrick, a forensic genealogist specializing in employing DNA analysis for cold case resolutions, to ascertain the identity of the Somerton man. The basis for their identification rested on hairs captured on his death mask. Although the state coroner has yet to officially endorse the conclusions reached by Abbott and Fitzpatrick, the former expresses confidence in the accuracy of their scientific analysis. In his words to Natasha May of The Guardian, Abbott emphasizes that the role of the scientific community is to present the information derived from DNA. While the legal determination of the individual's identity falls within the purview of law enforcement. In their pursuit to narrow down potential candidates, Abbott and Fitzpatrick utilized the genealogical research database GED Match in putting the Somerton man's DNA. Upon discovering a match to a distant cousin, the researchers meticulously constructed an extensive family tree comprising approximately 4,000 individuals. Employing archival records, they then sought individuals whose life stories aligned with the known details about the Somerton man. Carl Charles Webb, born in the Australian state of Victoria in 1905, emerged as a fitting match. Colleen Fitzpatrick elaborates on the process, stating to Alan Hughes of the New York Times, In all this vast network of DNA connections, we were able to link one of them to Carl's father and one of them to Carl's mother. This narrowing down process significantly pointed towards Carl among his siblings particularly since there is no documented death record for him. The quest to unravel the mystery of the Somerton Man began on the night of November 30, 1948. Two separate couples chanced upon the sight of a smartly dressed man lying on the sand, his head propped against a seawall, as detailed by MacDash in Smithsonian Magazine. Initially, the couples dismissed the enigmatic figure, assuming him to be either drunken or a beachgoer in a deep slumber, and refrained from approaching him. It was only the subsequent morning that the police were called to Somerton Beach in response to reports of a deceased body. According to a 1949 inquest report, a doctor who examined the remains estimated the time of death to be around 2 a.m. The unidentified man, standing at 5 feet 11 inches and aged between 40 to 50 years, had neither money nor identification. Strikingly, all tags on his clothing had been intentionally removed. In his pockets, investigators discovered cigarettes, matches, a pack of juicy fruit gum, a used bus ticket, an unused train ticket, and two hair combs. 
While experts were unable to definitively determine the cause of the Somerton man's demise, three medical witnesses who testified during the inquest unanimously concurred that the death was not natural. City coroner Thomas Erskine Cleland presiding over the inquest stated, There was no indication of violence, and I am compelled to the finding that death resulted from poison. I cannot say whether it was administered by the deceased himself or by some other person. Despite widespread public appeals and increasing media coverage surrounding the mystery, the identity of the Somerton man remained elusive. About a month after his death, authorities discovered a suitcase believed to belong to him at the Adelaide railway station. Notably, a spool of thread in the suitcase matched the orange stitches used in repairing the man's clothing. The contents included a shaving brush, shoe polish, a knife, scissors, a screwdriver, and assorted attire, some of which bore labels with variations of the name T. Kim. A tailor, consulted to examine the clothing, concluded that it was manufactured in the United States, lending credence to the theory that the Somerton man was not a local resident. The next significant clue emerged in May 1949, when pathologist John Cleland re-examined the corpse and discovered a rolled-up piece of paper hidden in the man's pants pocket. The paper bore the phrase, Tamam Shud, Persian for it's finished or it's ended, and was eventually traced back to the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, a 12th century book of Persian poetry popularized by an 1859 English translation. Fiona Ellis Jones, host of the Somerton Man Mystery Podcast, expresses a poignant perspective on the situation, stating to the Australian broadcasting company's ABC Bridget Judd, it's hard to see this as anything other than intentional. A suicide note perhaps, or maybe a final goodbye to a lover. In a significant turn of events in July 1949, a local resident stepped forward with a copy of the Rubaiyat that he had discovered thrown into the back of his car, around the time of the Summerton man's death. The torn-out fragment found in the pocket of the deceased perfectly aligned with a gap on the final page of the discarded book. Intriguingly, the book contained various handwritten annotations, including a suspected code and the phone number of a nurse named Jessie Jo Thompson, residing in proximity to the location where the body was found. When presented with the death mask of the Somerton man, Jessie Thompson's reaction was described by Detective Sergeant Lena Lane as one of being completely taken aback, to the point of giving the appearance she was about to faint. However, despite the apparent shock, she denied any knowledge of the man, and authorities refrained from pressing her further on the matter. Subsequently, the investigative trail went cold. The enigma surrounding the Somerton man persisted for approximately seven decades, fostering a landscape of speculation and increasingly fantastical theories. Some observers pointed to the so-called code discovered in his copy of the Rubaiyat, coupled with the apparent efforts to conceal his identity, suggesting he might be a Russian spy. Cryptography experts, however, argued that the string of letters did not constitute a code. Derek Abbott, a prominent researcher in the case, proposed to ABC that they likely represented the first names of horses Webb had bet on. An alternative theory proposed that the Somerton man was a former professional ballet dancer, drawing on the coroner's observations about his scalp muscles, described as high and well-developed, such as found in women, and the suggestion that he may have habitually worn high-heeled and pointed shoes. Perhaps one of the more compelling hypotheses centered on Jesse Thompson's son, Robin, whose distinctive ears and teeth closely resemble those of the Somerton man. Derek Abbott, who dedicated over two decades to researching the Somerton man, had a significant personal connection to the case. Upon learning of Thompson's death in 2007 and Robin's in 2009, he embarked on a quest to find Robin's living descendants. To his surprise, he discovered that his current wife, Rachel Egan, was Robin's granddaughter. Adopted as a child and raised in New Zealand, Egan was unaware of her potential ties to the cold case. Remarkably, a day after meeting each other, Abbott and Egan decided to marry. In jest, Rachel Egan remarked to ABC in 2019, 
people have said that possibly Derek married me for my DNA. And I think there is some truth to that. Last May, authorities in Adelaide exhumed the Summerton man's body and are currently conducting genetic testing on the remains. It's important to note that the DNA analyzed by Derek Abbott and Colleen Fitzpatrick came from the Summerton man's death mask, not his body, and was a part of a separate investigation. Contrary to Abbott's initial suspicions, the new DNA survey revealed no genetic ties between Rachel Egan and Carl Webb, definitively establishing that Robin was not Webb's son. In addition to the DNA results linking the Somerton man to Webb, Abbott and Fitzpatrick uncovered substantial archival evidence supporting the identification. Born in Footscray, a suburb of Melbourne, on November 16, 1905, Webb was the sixth child of a German-born man and an Australian woman, as reported by ABC's Rebecca O.P. In October 1941, he married Dorothy Jean Robertson, listed as a 21-year-old foot specialist on the marriage certificate, while Webb was a 35-year-old instrument maker. The last historical mention of Webb dates back to April 1947 when he left his wife. In October 1951, three years after the Somerton man's death, Dorothy announced in the Age newspaper that she had initiated divorce proceedings against Webb due to desertion. By then, Dorothy had relocated from Melbourne to Butte, a town 89 miles northeast of Adelaide. Abbott suggests the possibility that Webb came to South Australia to seek out his estranged wife, stating to CNN, it's possible that Webb came to the state to try and find her. This is just us connecting the dots. We can say for certain that this is the reason he came, but it seems logical. Records indicate that Webb had interests in reading and writing poetry, along with a penchant for betting on horse races. He had a sister residing in Melbourne, married to a man named Thomas Kane, likely the T. Kane whose name appeared on the clothing in the Somerton man's suitcase. Abbott speculates that the American origins of the attire may be attributed to Kane purchasing secondhand clothing from a U.S. serviceman stationed in Australia. Despite extensive efforts, Derek Abbott and Colleen Fitzpatrick have been unsuccessful in locating a photograph of Carl Webb. However, ABC's OP notes that an image of Webb's deceased brother Roy, who was a prisoner of war in Malaya during World War II, exhibits a striking resemblance to the Somerton man. Numerous questions surrounding the case persist. What prompted Webb to visit Somerton Beach? What was the cause of his death? Did he take his own life? Or was he a victim of foul play? And most significantly, what connection, if any, did he have to Jesse Thompson? Abbott and Fitzpatrick aim to unravel these mysteries through continued archival and genetic research. As Abbott expresses to ABC, some answers may come soon, some may take years, and some may never be answered. Reflecting on the revelation of Webb's identity, Carolyn Billsboro, a filmmaker who directed a 2018 documentary about the Somerton man, shares her sentiments with The Guardian. We had all these grandiose ideas about him being Russian, American, and European. I was convinced that he was from Europe, maybe a displaced person after the Second World War. He was there alone. But to find out that he's Australian, from Victoria, and that he died and no one obviously noticed he was missing, or no one followed up with the police that he was missing, I find that particularly kind of tragic. As we conclude our exploration into the mystery of the Somerton Man, we're left with more questions than answer. What could have fueled 75 years of silence and countless theories surrounding this enigmatic figure? Your insights and thoughts are invaluable to our investigation. If you enjoyed diving into the intriguing world of true crime with us, don't forget to hit the like button, share your comments, and subscribe to Crime Scene Archives for more captivating stories. Your support fuels our quest for the truth. And if you're interested in more mesmerizing cases, check out our video on Darren Rainey, the man whose death opened up a series of mysteries and hated accusations at a Florida state prison. Until next time, keep exploring the shadows with us. Thank you for joining Crime Scene Archives.